For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. If you would like to support the channel and become part of our Ancient History fan community, visit patreon.com slash world of antiquity. Welcome to the Antiquities Travel Guide. Follow us to different countries as we search for ancient artifacts. If you too wish to explore the ancient past through travel, we'll help you plan where to go, what to see, and how best to enjoy what you encounter. In this series of the ATG, you can accompany Cassie and me on our trek through the Yucatan Peninsula, homeland of the ancient Maya. Come on, let's go. The sites we'll be featuring in this episode are Key Cocker in Belize, Bacalar in Mexico, Chacchoban, the site of an ancient city, and the Grand Cenote in Tulum, a sacred place of the Maya. All great locations to visit if you're ever on the southeastern side of the Yucatan. After visiting Barton Creek Cave, which I showed you in our last episode, we headed west on the western highway until we reached Belize City. There we parked our car and caught a water taxi which we booked ahead, the San Pedro Belize Express. You can sit inside or outside. We chose outside. It was windy, but fun. Hang on to your hats. The ride to Key Cocker took about 45 minutes. Now you may be wondering why we went to Key Cocker. There aren't any ancient sites or museums there, are there? No, but hey. Cheers. After a full week of visiting ancient sites without let up, Cassie and I decided to take a day off. And what better place to go for rest and relaxation in Belize than one of the keys off the coast? The next morning, we decided to go out and do a little exploring. Just like really uh, relaxing, peaceful. Um, got a lot of personality too though, like the locals. Um, when you're walking down the streets, they're always trying to sell you stuff. Impressions? I like this a lot. Key Calker's great. From what I hear, San Pedro, which is another island, is where all the spring breakers and, and, and party animals go. But Key Calker is the sort of the more relaxing area, and we really love it. It's just peaceful here. Um, beautiful day. It started out cloudy, but now it's sunny. And but although I'm sitting in the shade, it's cool. It's about 82, maybe. Might be less than that in the shade, and uh, really comfortable. And we were just walking around this morning and checking everything out. Really liked it. Great place to go. Great place for a vacation. Highly recommended. It's nice to have a day off, rejuvenate, get ready for our next few Mayan sites. We stayed at the Tropical Paradise Hotel, which was one of the more affordable places, and it was nice. But we hung out at another hotel, which I think may be the best one on the island, and that is the Iguana Reef Inn. They have a beautiful spot on the water with a seahorse farm, pelicans, a nice bar, water hammocks, and swings. We stayed for the sunset, and it was magnificent. I'm not going to go into detail about that entire day because, hey, this is an ancient history channel, but I wanted to give you an idea of what it's like in case you ever want to go there. And as a bonus for patrons of this channel, I will post some additional footage over on Patreon. The next morning it was raining, and we were worried about what it would be like on the water. But we rode inside, and it wasn't too bumpy, so all was good. At the port, we got some coffee and a bite to eat at a place called The Last Drop, which is a good spot. After that, we headed north, and there was an ancient site I wanted to visit called Seros near Corozal. But there was a long delay at the ferry, which you need to take to get there. And we realized we didn't have time if we were going to make it to Bacalar on schedule. So we turned back and returned our car to Carolina Auto in Corozal, hopped on the shuttle provided by Belize VIP. 
I told you about them in our Lamanai episode. The drivers were super nice and they got us across the border no problem, although we did have to wait in line and pay a departure fee. Then we picked up our Mexican car rental, which we had left in Chetumal, and drove to our hotel in Bacalar. Bacalar, what a beautiful town, right on Lake Bacalar. Cassie was tired, so she rested while I went out to explore the town. It's used to tourists, so it's a bit easier to find servers who speak English at the restaurants. I had a snack at Savora Bacalal, and my guacamole was delish, and the drinks were top-notch. The next morning, I showed Cassie around town. We had breakfast at a place called El Manatee, which specializes in healthy foods. It's vegan, vegetarian, and gluten-free friendly. Very enjoyable. We highly recommend it. They have a little boutique shop as well. Then it was time to learn more about the ancient Maya. So uh, what did you think of Bacalar, the place we stayed last time? I loved it, yeah. It was the Hotel Maria Maria. It was really nice. They had the um, towel shaped like a swan. It was all folded <laughs> all pretty. I've never seen one like that. It was very, yeah, very nice hotel. Um, good deal. What was the place we went to this morning? El Manati. El Manati was so cool. Yeah, there were all these like beautiful spots to sit and eat breakfast. Breakfast was great. I had pancakes with like granola and fruit, uh, and then there it was a good deal too. It was like mm -hmm. 150 pesos or so each. Yeah. yeah, and that included like coffee and juice. It was really nice, and it was uh, right by that Spanish fort that you saw last night too. Yes, that was a cool fort. As we drove up the eastern coast of the peninsula, we arrived at the largest archaeological site in the region of the lakes, Chacchobin which means place of the red corn in Yucatec Mayan, named after the local village and lake of the same name. It's not the original name. Agricultural settlers first came here around 200 BCE, taking up residence around the lake. One thing you'll notice right off the bat are more buses and cars, more people, and a much bigger souvenir shop. They're used to getting more business here than any of the other places we've been to, including Ushmal. There are restrooms, snacks, and drinks to purchase, but no on-site museum. The site is compact, so you can see all of it in about an hour. Guides are available on-site if you want anyone to show you around. The cost for entry to Chaco Ben is 60 pesos per person, and you'll get a lot of shopping done right there at the entrance. The first complex you'll encounter is Plaza B, or the West Plaza. Temple 24 is the largest structure and will pop right out at you. Notice the graceful curved lines of the architecture that's typical of the Peten style. Because of its connection to an extensive trade network, Chakchobin shows other later architectural influences too, specifically the Chenes and Rio Beck styles that I showed you in earlier episodes. The pyramid's construction dates to between 250 and 600 CE the period of the site's peak development. And if you've been paying attention, you know that that's the early classic period. It's about 36 feet high and has an unrestored temple on top. There are stairways on all four sides of the pyramid, two that go to the top and two that go to the fourth level, and then smaller stairways lead from the fourth level to the summit. Chakchobin's Grand Plaza has not been cleared. All the trees kind of obscure its size. Next to the Grand Plaza on the southeast side is a series of platforms known as Las Vias, or the Roads Group. You'll find many long, low-stepped platforms, which are housing foundations, most likely the residences of the governing class, dating to the late classic period, 600 to 900. One chamber still shows vestiges of the original red paint. Two stelas with hieroglyphs were discovered here, but sadly they're too eroded to read. So we've been unable so far to identify Chakchobin's rulers by name, or ascertain its political and economic relationships with other cities. It's reasonable to suppose it had relations with Zibanche, which is right nearby. Further to the east is the Acropolis Plaza, the highlight of Chakchobin. Behind me is the entrance to the Great Acropolis, and this is the platform on which it sits. It's a massive base. It's called the Great Base, El Gran Basamento. It's about 16 feet high and 265 feet by 265 feet square, and the buildings sit on top of it. Can you imagine the massive amount of labor that went into building this? It's just mind-numbing. Wow. 
On the base level of the Acropolis Terrace in the northeast corner is the Temple of the Vessels. This is a pyramid with a single broad stairway. The thatched shelter that you see there on the rear of the pyramid is there to preserve what is left of a red finish on the surface of the structure. That finish is 1,200 years old. So here we are on top of the platform, and this is the, the biggest pyramid here. It's Temple Number One, it's called. Originally, it had two small buildings up at the top. Right now, it stands at about 42 feet high. And uh, you can see in front, there's a little building here, multi-room building uh, that sits in front of it. Uh, its use, we don't really know. The city was occupied until the Terminal Classic period. Man, were there all kinds of tourist buses there. They were coming either from Mahahual or further up the coast, but very different from the Mexican places we visited on the other side of the Yucatan where there weren't many people at all. Yeah, and those were definitely a bit farther out too. Like this one was kind of right off the highway. Mm -hmm. And a big gift shop with all the high-priced touristy souvenirs. Yeah, the chess sets were cool, but they were like 45 to $70 Americans. Pricey. Yeah. Yeah, they, they these cool uh, conquistadors versus Maya chess sets. <laughs> uh, and then now we're uh, driving our way up to Tulum. It's going to take about two and a half hours, and Tulum is a great town, I hear. Never been there, but uh, we've got a few, a couple of sites to go to today. We're shooting for, we don't know if we're going to make it, but we're going to shoot for the Grand Cenote, which is a really big one, and uh, Shell Ha, which is uh, Mayan ruins right within the uh, city limits of Tulum. Yeah. Tulum is a heavily touristed city with plenty to see and do. We grabbed lunch at a vegetarian friendly spot called Amaranto. Our dishes were super tasty. I got a stuffed pepper and mushroom soup with guajillo. Cassie got vegan tacos. Highly recommended. We were in the mood to go swimming and what better place to swim than in the Gran Cenote of Tulum, one of the most famous cenotes in Mexico. In case you don't know, a cenote is a natural hole in the earth, which is formed after extensive corrosion of the limestone rock by subterranean water. The Grand Cenote is open 10 to 5 every day and costs 200 pesos, which is about 9 bucks US. That's more than most of the archaeological sites. There are bathrooms and lockers here. You're required to take a shower beforehand. Cenotes are common in this area. There are over 6,000 of them in the Yucatan Peninsula alone. You can tell older cenotes from younger ones. If they are opened up to the sky, that means they've been around for a while. The younger ones are mostly underground. This would be a great place to snorkel because I don't know if you can see, but the water is particularly clear. The word cenote comes from the Mayan word sonote, which means underground water. And they kind of act like rivers more than they do lakes because they're all interconnected underground, these, these various sinkholes. In fact, this one here, the Grand Cenote, it isn't just one sinkhole, it's a bunch of them that are connected by tunnels that were created as the limestone corroded over the centuries. <laughs> So what do you think? It's great. I think it's better than just going down the Oh yeah. Uh, watch out for the stalactites. The Maya used these cenotes for two main purposes. One would be ceremonial or ritual. Uh, they would perform sacred rites here. The other was it was a source of water. So we have good fresh water here, uh, so much so that there's even creatures living in here. We saw some turtles, there's some bats up there, uh, there are fish. Uh, so these cenotes can definitely support life. I'm not sure about this particular one, but human skeletons from classic Maya times have been discovered in some of these cenotes, sometimes along with other items like pottery, jewelry, textiles, and weapons. Archaeologists have interpreted this as evidence of human sacrifice, people being thrown in to appease Chak, the water god, during times of drought. There have been some dissenters who've suggested that the skeletons belong to people who accidentally fell into the water-filled caves, but the fact that the remains were found only in areas that could be accessed when water levels were low does support the drought hypothesis. After swimming, people like to recline on the grass to dry off. 
We had a really great time the last couple of days, but we're looking forward to our next adventure, Koba, which we'll be visiting tomorrow and in our next episode, as well as a trip to Cancun to visit the Maya Museum there. If you want to make sure you see it, please subscribe. We'll see you next time.